is bats in the media how we can ensure balanced and accurate reporting it's a panel discussion about bats and how they get reported on my name is dan riskin i'm a bat biologist and science communicator based in canada and i'm going to be moderating this session um and can we come off that first slide and maybe get some get my face on there there it is um, so hopefully you'll be able to see uh, the different panelists that are involved here. I'm going to introduce them in a second. The idea behind this webinar is it's, uh, it's for people who work with bats. So that's biologists, conservationists, researchers, other people who want to learn more about interacting with the press. And the idea for this conversation came about when an international group of bat specialists decided that they wanted to be more organized in their strategies for dealing with media. And those researchers belong to a bunch of different groups, uh, among them the bat specialist group of the IUCN, the Global Union of Bat Diversity Networks, uh, GBATnet. And so here's the basic idea, and I think a lot of us have been there before. You're working on bats and you get a phone call from a journalist who has some questions. And maybe the questions are about your work specifically, or maybe it's about COVID-19 and the link to bats there. So how do you make the most of that opportunity? And how do you protect your credibility as a scientist and also ensure that the bats are gonna be reported upon in a favorable light? Or Maybe you're reaching out to the public directly. Maybe you've got some research you want to get into the news. How do you craft your message for a popular audience? What makes it interesting? How do you post it yourself? Do you post it yourself? Do you pitch it somewhere? And if you are gonna pitch it, how does that work? Where do you send it? Uh, and, and how does all that go down? We're gonna get to all of those topics and more, but uh, we also want questions from people who are attending this live. So I have an idea of where I wanna take this conversation. Um, I've talked with all the panelists I've picked their brains. I've got lots of great stuff that I'm going to pull out of them. But if you've got questions, the whole point of this is that it's for you. You're the audience. So if you've got a question that you really want answered, um, there's a Q&A function in Zoom uh, that you can be using right now to type in your questions. And I'm not going to be watching that directly because it tends to go by too fast and it makes me look distracted because I'll get distracted. So uh, we, I, we've got a team. Uh, we've got people who are watching that Q&A stream. If it's a simple question, they might just type in an answer for you right there. Um, but if, where it's a bigger question that would be good for the panel, uh, it's going to be sent to me on a separate document that I, so when you see me look down here, I'm looking at that document where the questions are coming in. So I'm not, I'm not sending emails to other people. That's what, that's what me looking down has to do with. Um, so you can send the questions in through the Q&A function of Zoom, or uh, if you prefer, you can send them in through social media. We have a team working uh, in social media as well, watching questions that come in through our Facebook page or via Twitter. If you're using Twitter, you can tag at Global Batnet. Uh, and in your question, and then we'll see it and we'll put it in the document. Or if you are feeling shy and don't want all your followers to know your question, um, you can always DM the question to at Global Batnet because uh, we're open to DMs from anyone. Um, so now that you have some sense of what to expect, let me introduce our panel. And I'll start with Dr. Liliana Davalos. She's a professor of conservation biology at Stony Brook University in New York. Her research is focused on molecular evolution, phylogenetics, and tropical biology. Her work is wide reaching. It bridges molecular methods with real life conservation. She's won tons of awards and grants for her teaching and for her research. She has considerable experience talking to the media. And in fact, just last week, you probably saw a paper she co-authored in Nature describing the genomes of six bat species. And I have certainly seen Liliana quoted in the news plenty since then. So she's, uh, she's got firsthand experience with dealing with the media around her own research. Dr. Adam Hart is a professor of science communication at the University of Gloucester in the UK. How do you say it, Adam? Is it Gloucester? Uh, it's Gloucestershire, but I have to say in my head, whenever I write it down, I always have to go Gloucestershire or I forget half of the letters. But Let's just say it's Gloucestershire because I think that's <laughs> a lot more fun to say. So, uh, uh, unfortunately for Adam, he is not a bat researcher, but he's still a very good person. Uh, his research is focused on social insects, including ants and wasps. He's also worked on spiders, starlings, lots of other animals, and often in the context of citizen science. Adam was the Royal Society of Biology's Science Communicator of the Year in 2010. He's appeared on television and radio, most notably the BBC, and his first book came out this year. It's called Unfit for Purpose, When Human Evolution Collides with the Modern World. It's a great title, and I'm sure it's a great book. Alex Morse is a freelance ecologist, journalist, educator, and author based in Bristol. She's done more than a decade of ecological consulting on protected species, including bats, but she's also done a great deal of writing as a journalist, sometimes about bats, sometimes other things. She's been published in The Guardian, The Independent, BBC Wildlife Magazine, lots of other places. And 
more than anyone on our panel, I think, Alex really understands the perspective of the journalist who's writing about bats and the possible tension that can exist between what that journalist needs and what the scientist wants. So I'm looking forward to picking her brain in this discussion. And finally, Dr. Tiga Kingston is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Texas Tech University. As you can see, she is sitting with a giant rhinolophus bat that's ready to give her a big kiss on the back of the head. Uh, her work spans ecology, conservation biology, evolutionary biology, mostly focused on the hyperdiverse bat communities of Southeast Asia. Now, one thing I've always admired about Tiga's work is the way she thinks very carefully about the context of her research. She does outreach in the US, but she also does her outreach in countries where the field work happens. Tiga makes a point of filling her lab with students from the countries where her study organisms live. She's deliberate about establishing infrastructure in those countries where she works so that the science and conservation can continue there in the long term. Tiga uh, has received the Jarrett S. Miller Award, which is the highest honor the North American Society for Bat Research gives. Only a handful of people have ever gotten that before. She's involved with countless societies and conservation groups, and she works tirelessly to improve the process of bat science for everyone involved. And so we've got a great panel. We've got four wonderful people with uh, very backgrounds uh, who are going to bring a lot to this conversation. And so I want to jump into it by asking Alex the first question. So, I mean, we're mostly scientists. So let's just start by trying to get a perspective on what journalists are feeling. So uh, Alex, can you give us a sense of what it's like to be a journalist right now in terms of their career landscape and, and where they live, where they work? Sure, um, it's very difficult at the moment. Um, the profession is going through a crisis with, in the UK, I can only speak for the UK, but I know it's other countries are similar with hundreds and hundreds of jobs cut across journalism. Um, in the last couple of weeks, the BBC, The Guardian, uh, Reach PLC, which is the biggest regional newspaper group, has had to share hundreds of, of jobs. Um, lots of newspapers and magazines are going bust. Uh, I think we've lost over 300 titles in the last decade. Budgets are being cut, um, and this is because, well, People don't really want to pay for words so much anymore. They want it free. They want social media. <laughs> um, so unless you can get the advertising revenue and or stick it behind a paywall, it's quite difficult to get the budget to do things as well as you might like to do. Um, when I started out um, a few hundred years ago, um, we used to go down the pub and get our stories and we would just go out for the day and get to meet everyone and really know our context. But um, increasingly, I, I don't think journalists leave the office. Um, Perhaps they do. I'm, be, I'm being unkind. They do leave the office, but there's so much pressure on you now to get the story quickly. So you can turn that to your advantage because you can, of course, use a press release and you can be as, by being as helpful as you possibly can. You're helping them out. They're extremely challenged with how much time they've got. So be their friend to, um, and be the best, be, be the best offer that day. Give them all they need so that you make it so easy for them. That they can't say no. Um, and they, they will hopefully thank you for that, as long as you've got your information correct. Um, I think that's a, that's a cognitive jump for a lot of scientists. They think of the press as this sort of self-sufficient group that uh, could, could be fine on their own. And we don't think of ourselves as helping them. We kind of think that we're parasites asking them to cover our work. But in fact, I, I like the perspective you give that we can be supporting these journalists and giving them some assistance. So um, Adam, I want to just get a sense of what kind of pressure these journalists are under on the day. So when you get a phone call from a journalist, what's likely happening in their world that day? What kind of a timeline are they on? Yeah, this, this is something I see a lot. I'll, I'll get a phone call or an email and yeah, I usually answer it straight away if I can. I'll get back to them as soon as possible. And I realize that sometimes even if there's only a couple of minutes delay, they've gone somewhere else because they need to get that story out very often within the hour. I mean, they're absolutely up against it sometimes. And, you know, I know from, from work that I've done when we've done live radio, we need people to be able to contribute. And, and if we can't get someone on the phone, we'll try someone else, we'll try someone else. And that would really be my biggest piece of advice actually to scientists. I, I know I've got colleagues who will say, oh, you know, I, I, I'm not being asked to do this. I got this email, but I replied to it. And I say, how long did you leave the email for in your inbox? Oh, you know, it was in there a couple of days, but by the time I got back to them, they'd found someone else. And it's like, yeah, you know, they'll find someone else if you don't get back to them within an hour. You know, it's, it's a, those, those pressures. I think there's, there tends to be this idea in science that somehow journalists are lazy and that, that, that you know, they spend all the time down the pub, like Alex has said, they're not really up against it at all. And actually the reality is completely different. The, the, the timelines they're up against. I mean, I was at the Cheltenham Science Festival a while ago when it was, actually a face-to-face -face event and, and the Times correspondent was there and he was writing three 800-word uh, articles that he had about an hour and a half to submit. It was unbelievable what they were being forced to do. And I think wow. at, at that stage, what they want 
is somebody who can tell the story, somebody who's clear, somebody who's going to give them information. And if you're that person, then, then you know, be, be that person and, and they'll come back to you. And when we spoke, you, you told me a story about a helium researcher and just why sometimes the, the world expert on something isn't always what they need. What they need. Can you explain yeah, that? I, I, often when we were contacting res researchers, we, we'd often find people saying, listen, you know, I'm not the world expert on this. You know, you want to talk to this person or you want to talk to that person. And, and actually what people don't realize is that, that very often what we want to do is talk to you because that's why we got in touch, you know. So we, we spoke to this guy. He just, he just basically discovered that helium uh, would, is not inert. Um, and that under the normal pressures and temperatures that you find inside suns, uh, inside stars, uh, helium will actually react fairly freely, um, which is a magnificently huge discovery. Um, and we spoke to the guy and we thought this is gonna be brilliant. This rewrites the, you know, the first chapter of most chemistry textbooks and so on. And after about half an hour of you know, really quite painful um, teasing out, we managed to get about 30 seconds of usable audio. And then we went to someone much, much further down who, who was just really, really animated chemist who knew about inert gases, was really excited about it and could fill in all of the gaps. And they kept saying, oh, you know, you need to speak to this person or that person. It's like, no, we need to speak to you because you're telling us what we need to hear. You're doing it in a way that's engaging. And I think that's the thing. I think a lot of researchers tend to think that there's someone higher up the food chain that the people should be speaking to and actually know. We, we, you know, we, we should be speaking to the people that can tell those stories. So the, the helium wasn't inert, but he was, is basically the, the <laughs> yeah. story there. He just wasn't animated. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and and it seemed actually almost um, quite bored of his own discovery by that. And possibly he was. Perhaps he talked himself out with lots of other things, but, but that wasn't what we needed. You know? and, we, and we needed to get the audio sorted out pretty quickly. Tigger, you've thought a lot about how journalists make their decisions. And so what is it that a journalist does to make something news when it's not really new like there, some of the things we study are like well we just you know that this is how the world works and it's worked like that for eons um but how do they make it news um well that, that's a good question and sometimes it just as a as an observer of this world it, it seems like they'll often say the complete opposite of what has been say mm -hmm. been being said so when we began for example with the covid 19 and sars cov2 emergence we began with very extreme demonization of bats and their role. Um, and, but then we noticed possibly a couple of months later that once that story had played out a little bit, we started seeing journalists talking about actually taking our perspective or taking the other perspective that they, that um, a broader look at the role of bats in, in the environment and ecology in um, supporting human health on the other side and um, uh, and so that actually presents an opportunity to kind of get in there and redress the balance a bit but that was just an observation so it'd be interesting to hear how um, from um, Adam and Alex about at what point do do journalists take a landscape view of the story and decide you know this is a story that continues to play and play and play how do they keep keep those um, balls in the air and make it interesting and do they actively position themselves uh, against what everybody else is saying just so that they have a more interesting article yeah, that's that's a great point, and I think it fall, more generally falls into the category of conflict. And so sometimes the the, the argument between two researchers can be really dynamic. Um, and we're going to get a little bit into what makes for a good story and makes an interesting story for the press in a second. Um, but I want before we get to that, I want us to just stop for a moment and think about what we want, right? So now we've we've had a second to think about what the press is after and what their world's like and and what they're trying. You know, they're trying to meet that deadline and get their story out. Um, and they want somebody who's in, uh, dynamic and animated. But what are we optimizing? So Liliana, let me start with you. I mean, why does good bat outreach matter, especially in the time of COVID-19? So bat outreach is incredibly consequential. It's really important right now, more than ever before, because our understanding of um, the risks that come from uh, viruses that circulate in wild populations is still rather poor. And Instead, we have, uh, you know, sensationalized accounts that came out early on, just like Tigo was describing. Some of this, we're just trying to kind of find a rationale. When some big event happens, we want to we wanna find a, a sort of reason within the mayhem. And these led to actual actions, like people that were misinformed by this sensationalized accounts were taking actions that were harming bats. And, and without 
taking account of all the scientific evidence, which is kind of gushing in and which is a, an ever evolving, um, an ever evolving knowledge that is coming precisely because of the crisis that we're in. So taking, so the, we are in this moment in which taking, um, communicating the science is part of taking action in favor of bats, in favor of bats as uh, wild populations, in favor of ecosystem services, in favor of resolving conflicts between human populations and bat populations. It's, it seems to be like a niche situation in which science communication was staying in its own sphere and was being attached to scientific findings that didn't have real world impact. It has very much this massive impact now. Alex, I want to know your perspective on this as a journalist. Do, do you see those things happening when people write about science well, when, when that happens? Do you see that on the ground momentum shift? Yeah, and there's new research on this. Um, and this is something I'm trying to look at in more detail. And I'd love at the end, if people want to sh share their examples to me, they can get hold of me on social media because something I'm, I'm gathering evidence on at the moment. Uh, but there are academics looking at what the, what the, social impact is of people reading or watching the news and then how their behavior might change and somebody put a paper out earlier this year in um in the states looking at um the type of television channel that somebody watches left or right wing and um i'm not going to name channels but um and then what what their personal behavior and belief was on climate change and climate science and there was a very strong significant link between watching rubbish on tv and believing it and then consequential actions um so there is evidence out there that what you do matters you're not just talking to a wall you're talking to somebody that's human who's going to possibly change how they behave or join a charity or go out there and volunteer because of what you did and sometimes i think we forget we're just one person and we think no i'm not gonna make much difference but you know, if you try something, especially when you're doing outright reach and look at the reaction you get. If you, you know, if you can't get something in the mainstream media, so what, get it on social media. If you fail to get it in the main media, talk on your local radio station, do live talks. It doesn't have to be the mainstream media and see people come back and say they're interested and they want to hear more. Um, and that does directly lead to action. There was some interesting research done at Derby Uni this year, at the, Dar at the University of Derby in, uh, in the UK, looking at nature connection and how connection to nature, a feeling of closeness to nature, does directly have consequences, beneficial con consequences for nature, because it does result in actions that help to conserve species. So what we're doing communicating is part of that. You know, there is a, there is a measurable gain to achieve. So I never think, oh, Oh, it's just you you write an academic paper and you get it in nature and maybe five people read it. i don't know how many people read nature but if you get it in the media okay you've had to dumb it down you've had to take all the science out and mm -hmm. you wanted to just tell your nerd friend all the really interesting stuff and basic person who's reading it in whatever newspaper it is might have never met a bat before they might not know anything about them and suddenly they're enthused about bats and might <laughs> check before they convert their loft and not kill bats so you can have a really good impact even if you can't measure it yourself but i'm interested in measuring that so yeah that's something we could talk about um, liliana what you go ahead you, you've got something to say yeah, no, I think I think Alex has touched on so many different points right there in in talking about how the media, uh, how how stories get developed, and also whether someone developing a story is thinking about it as a story that has no, that makes no changes on the ground and actually ch makes those changes on the ground. One thing that I that I think I hadn't thought about before until hearing Alex is this the the issue in which we have this sort of chain. Uh, of increasingly uh, bowdlerized or sensationalized. Uh, news bits, right? So you may have the original paper and you may have a press release that may be very good or very bad. I don't know, you know, like depending on the quality. And then you may have like an, an actual article that was scientifically informed by a very thoughtful person. And then you may have snippets of it pop up. There's all these aggregators, right? And it's almost like artificial intelligence is writing some of this or people who are on some crazy deadline and are just kind of like picking a little bit. So for example, I've been in situations in which uh, actually, people, uh, journalists have contacted me about quotes uh, where, you know, that were things that were put on a press release 10 years ago and for what that got recycled into some news story. And the journalist who wrote that, that article that now I'm being quoted back never contacted me, right? So in other mm -hmm. words, there's this kind of like 
information degradation that is happening mm -hmm. along along the way, and some of it may, may be in directions that are totally unexpected. And I, I was wondering if, as journalists, you could kind of speak to to that that situation where again, like bots, there's like bot aggregation, right? Like there's not. I don't even know half the time whether there's a real person uh, who is quoting that press release anymore. Uh, Adam, can you speak to that? Or, oh, sorry, um, go ahead, I, I Alex. I can't actually. I was just going to pick up on another point, but if Alex can speak to that, I can always get back to back to that. Okay, I'll go um, Alex, and then we'll go back to Adam. Well, there's an interesting thing developing that I'm not very comfortable about, and it's it's an algorithm, a machine that lurks somewhere in the UK in a big newspaper office that measures the algorithms and works out what clickbait to put out next, um, and it could potentially turn those press releases directly into stories work out the headline for you and almost take out the human interaction in that process which i think is devastating for anyone who likes stories and likes real stories and likes them told by humans um but your point about picking up on a story that's 10 years old um stories have a shelf life and a story is something that's new it's news it's storytelling we, we've We've loved storytelling since we were in caves. You know, it, we need food, need water, we need shelter, we need love. And I think we need stories. And people love stories if they're told well. So if, if a story is, has been saturated across the media, possibly no one will want it anymore. But if it hasn't been around for 10 years, as you said, let's revisit that and make something novel about it because novelty is one of the things that people love about storytelling. Adam? Um, yeah, so now I was going to um, talk about this point about making a difference, and I think you, you can, but it, you have to chip away at it. So um, some of the, you mentioned earlier some of the citizen science stuff that I've done. So we looked at flying ants for, for a number of years, which uh, the winged reproductive of ants, they cause a huge stir here every year in Britain. It's like the same thing. Oh, the flying ants are taking over. Predictably every year. I've spent, I've done two radio broadcasts today about flying ants and several um, uh, last week. It's a very, very predictable thing. Um, then I looked at house spiders, which every autumn they come into our homes and, oh my God, the world's being taken over by spiders every single autumn. And then I also study wasps, which at the end of the summer, oh my God, the world's being taken over by wasps. And what I found was that by, by putting out some press releases, by, by sharing some of that research, by positioning myself so that I could talk about it on some of the mainstream media, now, when flying ants happen or when spiders happen or when wasps happen, actually me or someone else will get a call and suddenly we're not just a sentence at the end that say, oh, and some scientists say that actually they're more important than we thought. Actually, they're more from the perspective now of, well, what is it? Yeah, this is interesting. Flying ants are happening. They're a bit annoying, but you know, what about them? And I, I found, I haven't studied this and it's something that I want to look into, but I've definitely got the feeling that the, the narrative has shifted slightly into, I mean, it's still there a little bit, but it's been into a slightly more, um, uh, these are interesting phenomena that we might want to understand. And actually some of these organisms are, are more important than we thought. And it's, it's taken a while and you still have to chip away at it and you still see the odd nonsense being, being published. But I think that's what's important. I think we have to keep at it. M most of these stories, like Alex says, they, they have this kind of rhythm. Some of these stories have an annual rhythm and it's, you know, you can set your calendar by them. Some of them take a few years to go through, but actually every time that opportunity comes up, if we can get that message out, then it starts to, you know, people inevitably look at other stories that have been written and they can see that these chunks of sort of what scientists say get, get a little bit longer and a little bit more complex. And I think that's, we just have to keep at it, basically. We're, we're, fighting, Perfect. we're fighting against it. So Adam, you're transitioning perfectly to the next thing I want to sort of talk about, which is how to, how to distill your message, how to, how to figure out what you're going to say. And I think a great way to start is for you to tell us about uh, a billboard with a spider's face on it. This is a story that you told me about. Can you, can you explain that for me? Yeah, so uh, we, we started this citizen science campaign to look at, look at the emergence of house, well, not the emergence, but house spiders come into our homes around October time and it's spider season and we think they're all males, but actually there's no real nationwide data. So we decided to do a study of it and we had to get lots of people taking part. So I put out a press release and I thought, well, no one's going to pick up on this unless we've got a hook. So I said, well, we've had this really good summer, um, lots of invertebrates around. Maybe these spiders will have had the chance to get their full potential. Maybe we'll see some big ones in the autumn. That was a mistake. Um, I was driving <laughs> down the road past a petrol station, a gas station here, and on the front page of the star was just a picture of a spider. That was it. One of the boldest front pages I think I've ever seen. And I felt, I actually felt like I'd been punched in the stomach. I was like, oh God, what have I done? Because I knew that this was something to do with our spider thing. And sure enough, actually inside, 
away from all the headlines and when we're being invaded by massive spiders, there was actually a very, very sensible story. They pulled a lot of stuff out of our press release. It was really, really good coverage. But because of that front page, everyone else picked up on it. We were on Radio 2 and on the telly and everything. We got huge numbers of people involved with the, with the project. But it came from that kind of lurid headline. And I think that that can be something that as scientists, we sometimes just have to roll with. You know, like, like Alex was saying earlier, there are different priorities and different ways of looking at it. I wouldn't have deliberately have pitched that the way that it ended up. But actually from doing that, our study was a far greater success than it would have been without, frankly. We, would, we needed as many people as we had to get, to get the data we needed. Um, so it was, a, it was a, a lucky happenstance, but yeah, I have to say it was a bit of a, it was a, bit of a scary one at the time. Adam, that's, that's a mystery for spiders. You've got spiders on the front page. I mean, even I if they had a you know, negative yeah. twist on it, spiders are one of those emotional things that the, the, the click, they're a clickbait species, yeah. you know? Yeah, it ended, yes, it ended you... up, that, that was one of the busiest days. I had to go and buy a power pack halfway through the day to keep my phone running. Um, you know, at one point I had to say, listen, I can't talk to you anymore because I physically can't hold my phone because it's too hot. But it was really, it was just it was a really successful day, but it was completely accidental. And because a journalist had seen an angle, quiet news day and suddenly it blew up. You never know when that sort of thing is going to happen. You can't plan for it necessarily. I'm sure some some people try to. But but when it does, you just have to roll with it and you can't be going, oh, actually, I didn't say that. And blah, blah. You kind of did say right. that. Just just try and try and get your message out and be quite clear about it. It's a good idea to have those sort of three points in your head. Mine was that actually, you know, house spiders, they, they're only around for a few weeks. They're harmless, more or less. And actually, spiders are really interesting and they do lots of important things. And, and if you just sort of keep at it, you can get that out at the end. But, but you do have to get through the... the lure so you make a list of three things. Numbers. You make a list of three things and you hit those every time the phone rings? Yeah, I try to. Um, same with wasps. You know, wasps are pretty much universally loathed. Um, by most people, um, but you have to be able to get people to to realize that they're more important. And, and we, we've now gone with the fact that they're amazing natural pest controllers. They actually do some really interesting pollination. And you think honeybees have cool social lives. Well, so do wasps. They have the same sort of setup. And this seems to sort of get some people in. But obviously, at yeah, the end of the day, you aren't going to convert a hardcore wasp hater to suddenly opening up their loft and setting up a wasp hotel with, with three facts. But you might, like Alex was saying, you might just steer people in a little bit. You, you never know what the impact is. And year on year, that's sort of hitting away at the rock. You know, you can eventually crack it down to gravel, I think. Yeah, that's, you know, speaking to you and also to Alex, I think I realized the blind spot I have uh, that, there's this possibility that maybe some people won't think bats are cute. And even <laughs> if I do this interview, they may still weirdly not think bats are cute. And I think for bat biologists, that for me, that's a total blind spot. Like I didn't even consider that until we'd had this conversation. And so you talk about having sort of different levels of your message. Like you've got a message that you're going to hit the people that hate wasps no matter what. And this is what I want them to take home. And I'll try to convert some people. So, so how does that setup work? Yeah, I guess I guess the first thing we want to do is, is for people not to instantly think I have wasps and I'm going to kill them. And I guess it's the same with bats. Oh, my God, there's something in my house that's not a human. It must die. You know, that is that is the kind of <laughs> we need to stop people from doing that. And, and to do that, you're never going to reach everyone. Right. But but if you can come out with some sort of message that that. that brings people a little bit away from that then then that is a big win past that though you're absolutely right you know i, I spoke after we spoke actually i had a few I, I sent out a few random messages to people and just oh, what do you think of bats and most people were either you know they didn't really have strong feelings one way or the other or they're like well they're freaky they come out at night i've never said and several people said well i've never properly seen one which struck me as being quite interesting mm -hmm. um i've taken people out with bat detectors before you know just friends when we've been camping or something and you can see even if they're not really into it their faces light up it's some, there's a magical sure discovery to be had now we can't do that with everyone but but it's that type of hook if you can find something just to bring people in you know like i know lots of people are scared of moths for example well you open up a moth trap with pretty much anyone you're pretty much on a winner right especially if you've got a few cool things in there because it's a it's a magical world that they don't get to see and i think with bats there is that it's just very very difficult to access it because it's at night and they don't communicate in frequencies we can hear very easily they fly around when we can't see them. They have all this mysterious cultural attachment. But but if you can get around that, you only need one hook just to pull people over. And I think that's 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 the key. 
Yeah, Alex, I see you raising your hand. Yeah, um, so what's essential here is the emotional reaction. If you're getting an emotional reaction from somebody, I, th I think you've got to win and it might be hate. But if that person reacts enough to talk to somebody else in their family or friendship, friendship circle about it, you've already half won because they're talking about it. That's how I view it anyway. If you think about a scientist writing in a journal, they're going to want their publication to be read by a bunch of other scientists. Um, if you're writing for a newspaper, you don't want somebody to flip, to flip past your story and not read it. You want somebody to see it and not just read the headline and not just look at the picture, but read the whole story. And um, something that artists get, I think that maybe the rest of us don't, is if you walk around an art gallery, you see art on the walls and you want somebody to stop and look at that picture and have an emotional reaction, whatever that reaction might be, right? Why don't we have science and geography and history and other topics on the walls in art galleries? Why have we only got art galleries? Why have we got these other galleries sharing this stuff? And mm. You need an emotional reaction. And, and in a way, I think you can use the media to get that for you um, because you're not going to get it so much in science paper. You're not going to reach those. You're not going to engage with those people that otherwise wouldn't sure. engage. And if, if engaging for them is an emotional reaction, you've got a reaction. You've got them interested. They didn't just flick past that story and look at wherever it was on the next page. So you have to see all of those exposures as wins. Yeah, you, uh, Liliana, I want to jump to you. But first, I just want to get to Tiga because one of the first things Tiga said when we uh, spoke was that there are people who are experts on science communication and you don't have to do this alone. They can help you craft the message. So I wonder, Tiga, have you ever taken advantage of any of those resources? Um, well, actually, sorry, um, can I just follow up? I'm going to yeah, jump in and please. follow up on Alex's um, point because um, what we know from the theoretical literature about what structures people's attitudes towards bats, moths, wasps, whatever. There's good reason to divide it up into these three, uh, three areas, these three domains. And one is what you know about it, the knowledge. Right? And that's where we as scientists tend to fall. We think if we tell people this about bats or this about wasps, that's going to completely change their attitude and they'll swing from being a, a bat hater to a bat lover. But there are two other really important elements that structure an attitude and one is your past experience so if you got stung by a wasp it's going to be a bit of a sell to persuade you that wasps are lovely um but the other uh, um this is one that adam talked about is that we actually don't have much experience with with bats many members of the public don't even have an exp a bat experience so that can be very powerful about changing people's attitudes it is to go out with a bat detector is in areas where it's safe to show them live bats and, and see that they you know they're lovely um, but that third part, that emotion and that affect is very, very powerful. And that often shapes people's attitudes much more strongly and can override knowledge. It might be that, oh, I know bats are important, but I'm so scared of them and they're horrible, right? Or, yes, you tell me this, but I still don't want to go near one. Mm -hmm. But if we can work to engage people through the emotions uh, that can be important. And so how do we do that? There's ways we do that. We can share our emotion. As scientists, that's kind of trained out of us, right? You're not supposed to be emotional and your writing is meant to be very prescribed. But when you're moving into social media, when you're moving to public outreach and journalism, expressing your love, your passion, either verbally or one of my um, unceasing campaigns is to do this pictorially. So don't show a picture of a bat stuck in a mist net looking miserable with all its teeth showing. Show a picture of you holding the bat looking absolutely thrilled to show your affect, to share how exciting and thrilling bats are. So there are some kind of tricks in there that are not really tricks because they're based on the psychological literature and what people have found in other contexts that we really can be shifting in our efforts to reach out either through print journalism or, or social media or, or more structured opportunities if you can control the narrative say through by making videos or TikTok or whatever you want to do make a TikTok with you and a bat having a really happy time right it's mm -hmm. um that's it, it's all so I think the power of emotions and this is a growing field within conservation psychology really working how to lever this in our communication um is an important way forward so as we create our pitches, we have to think about that emotional content of it. Right. Yes. And what the we are very visually oriented, and whatever messaging people are hearing, 
or reading, blah, 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 right? But they see a picture, they see a video, that's what tells the story. As that's, you know. so yeah. that's so, so important with the media. If you've got a press release and you send it and it's just another press release on a desk or in their email box, but you've got a really nice photo or a really amazing or shocking or surprising photo or, or piece of video, that's, that might make the difference. That might be just what they needed that day. And so your, your, your story will get the coverage that it might not have. Okay, already. so that transitions perfectly to what I want to talk about next, which is, and I'll, I'll do it by taking a question that we're getting in. So lots of questions are coming in. I'm seeing the questions coming in. Uh, again, a reminder to our audience, use the Q&A function here, or you can use social media to reach out to us. Uh, there's a question from, a, 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 it looks like a, a just an up and starting bat biologist named Nancy Simmons. And uh, she has, uh, uh, she's, saying, she's asking, if I've got a story that I want to get out there, um, how do I get it out? Who do I reach out to? How do you pitch a story? And so Alex, I think you're the perfect person to take this question head on. A lot of people want to know, how do I, how do I get the ear of the media? Oh, it's not very easy. I mean, I'm a freelance journalist and I find it hard to get you in the media. <laughs> you know, I hassle them all the time as a freelance, like, cover this story, cover this story. And the answer might be, well, I might not get an answer a lot of the time. And the answer might be, oh, we did that last week. Uh, we don't really understand why your story matters. It's boring. Um, why should we care? Um, we've got too many other stories on today. We don't have the budget to cover it. Ugh, bats. Ugh, spiders. Or, um something in between which is that perhaps the writer isn't I mean a lot of journalists are not science qualified so it might not be their first passion a lot of them will have done a humanities degree or a history or politics degree or you know they've gone into journalism because they want to change the world from a human perspective not necessarily from a conservation perspective so you've got to be a bit of a salesperson but what the good thing to do and this it might be hard to do if you haven't got loads of stories to sell to or sell or you know not not literally sell but try and sort of market is um, to try and build up a relationship with one or two outlets. Um, and really, if you get it in one, they all copy each other. Not all of them, but you know, if you get it <laughs> on the BBC or you get it on the local radio, someone will hear it and then they'll phone you up and they, they're all chasing each other's tails all the time. So don't worry about trying to get it everywhere. Just you know, build a bit of a relationship up with one or two. Write yourself a press release. And if you haven't done one before, well, you can look online and you know find out how to do that. But essentially, don't don't go over more than one page. Just one page of an outline of what it is, why it is, why it's important, who it happened to, where it happened, and why this why this newspaper should care, why their readers should care. To actually, get past the journalists. Think think about their readers or their audience. Why is this for their audience? Why should they care about this? And try and actually t tell it like you would be telling it to your next door neighbour who doesn't know anything about bats. Well, explain it in, in those terms, in simple language, without any of the too much science. Don't put too much technical stuff in there. And make sure they know where they can get hold of you and give them a load of notice. Don't ring them up at the last minute. You know, give them a few days notice um, so that they've got time to respond. Um, and that is probably the best things you can do. I'm not sure if I'm missing. Anything. Yeah, what you said about relationships resonates from my experience. I mean, I do a bunch of TV here in Canada and it's, it's, they, they all just have me on their phone. And so they, they reach out to me with, with stories. Uh, Amy Russell is asking how, you know, how a person can become the go-to for, for journalists on a, a bunch of topics, right? So we all study bats, but maybe we'd like to be consulted because we feel like we're good communicators and we could be useful. Adam, do you have any advice in terms of how to build those relationships with journalists, how to start that conversation? Um, yeah, I think social media can be a very good place to to reach out. But I, I mean, actually, for me, what I, what I did was um, as soon as I, I moved into a new position, I contacted the local radio station and said, look, you know, I've done this, I, I used to do this bug slot on another local radio station, are you interested? And, you know, they said, we'll come in and have a, have a chat. And then suddenly they realized that, I mean, what you have to realize for a lot of things, for local radio and even for local press to a certain extent, it's really just a, um, uh, the, the talk is basically just to get from the news to the first record, from the first record to the set of ads, from the set of ads to the, to the hour, right? And they need stuff to go in, in there. They're, they're looking for content. Yeah. So if you make yourself available and sound interesting, they will likely want to be, want to be a part of it. And, and if you present yourself as being quite general, like I, I would say, and you know, I'll talk about science generally. So we used to get the listeners sending in all kinds of weird questions like, you know, how long does it take for something to fall from the top of the Grand Canyon and all that kind of stuff? And I'd sit and work it out for them. You know, that morphed into much more of an environmental kind of ecological thing. But I think that's a really good, a really good step because lots of places do want content. I would say also a very, very important thing, and it kind of links to what Alex was saying earlier as well, is to cultivate relationships within your institution in terms of the press office 
and sort of marketing and things because if you're based in a university the university will have a press office and they will have marketing but that marketing is mostly geared around selling the university but of course academics with cool stories although you can't put a number on it where you can put a column and inches equivalent sort of value on it but but it is very valuable it's valuable good copy it means that when you google the university you find interesting things so I would say to cultivate the relationships internal to your organization as well as external, because those links can be really valuable. But perhaps the key thing is just to get out there and realize that you know, people do want content, but it's a tough nut to crack, you know? Um, and you just have to be willing to, to see opportunity when it comes your way, which is very often a sort of sketchy message from someone saying, I've got half an idea, do you want to have a chat about it? And you say yes, and by the end of it, you know, I mean, that's how I ended up doing radio, actually. it was. Um, I ended up pitching a program on honey to a producer in about 30 seconds at the end of a, at the end of another meeting. And he happened to be there. And, and that was the first radio program I've done. And I did about, mm. done about 30 ever since, you know, it's, it's those opportunities. And, and sometimes it's a stroke of luck, but those relationships are key. Hey guys, I saw your hand go up briefly. Have you, are you feeling? Um, I was just going to um, re uh, reinforce my nodding about, um, the internal relationships and, and finding out your press officer within or particularly within in your own institution because they are often desperate for content um <clears throat> they're the, probably the most desperate for content compared to any other outlet um but also communicating within our own research community i'd just like to touch very briefly on this so one of the things the global um, union of bat diversity networks bgbatnet has been doing is trying to provide a curated blog of content summarizing what's been going on for in in this particular case with sars-cov-2 emergence because for many of us we may be um, Adam touched on the fact I think that you may be called to respond and you're like no I'm not the right person I'm not the right I know nothing about viruses please hey and you try and punt and actually that's my first instinct too is to punt right oh go and talk to this person but they may be coming back to you because you have actually noted because you know less you can perhaps communicate it it more um, mm. immediately to the target audience but it's very hard for say me to keep keep up with this fast moving field um, that is outside my personal domain of expertise. So sharing digests with one another through blogs, through GBATnet blog is just one example, but through your own blog, through your professor's blog, if you're a graduate student, um, that is absolutely incredibly valuable for us to be able to try and stay informed with one, um, in fast moving fields that are not necessarily our domain. So I would really encourage particularly early career and, and graduate students to hone some of these skills about sharing your own, your research. So that press release that can go internally, but then a, a press release is actually the same kind of medium that you would want for communicating with your peers, perhaps, but an annotated digest of the field that you're in and how your work contributes can be immensely valuable for us as a research community defending the position of bats in society to be able to give these informed perspectives because it can be the reason I always want to punt is because answering questions outside of my dom domain makes me anxious. I'm worried. Will I say the wrong thing? Um, am I out of date? Will I sound like a complete nonce, right? And so everybody has those fears. We're great as long as it's what we research, we can talk till the cows come home. But the minute it starts drifting, we, we start getting a little, we start having concerns. And so we need to support one another and help one another by providing informed digests and, and communicating internally as it were. Yeah. Fabulous. I'm going to move the conversation ahead to uh, our fears because uh, when I look at the comments that are coming in, uh, there is a chorus of people that are scared of mo often just being misquoted. And I think the idea is that as scientists, we give their stories some credibility, but it's our credibility that they're putting out there into the world. And so we've got this, this, this glass, beautiful sculpture that we've been working on for our whole careers to make it pretty and fragile and nice. And then we give it to these journalists and the idea is that they're going to misquote us and it's going to shatter our credibility. Um, and I wanted, Liliana, you told me uh, something about being taken out of context or misquoted and the way that that resolved for you. And I think that's a really powerful story. So could you take a moment to just tell that story to the audience here? 
Yeah, I think it, I think it's really interesting because I I uh, I was I've been trying to kind of grapple with the lessons learned from that. So basically, we wrote this paper a long time ago um, that was about uh, the fact that a lot of uh, features and traits in bats uh, from species that feed on nectar they've evolved independently a couple of times instead of just kind of evolving the ones and having inherited them from their common ancestor they had been evolved independently and in the introduction to that um, to that paper we wrote something that was just it was just meant to kind of contextualize the fact that uh, 20 years ago we used to try to build this evolutionary relationships this evolutionary tree of life we were building it just with one gene and so we would say, that's just one gene and we're just kind of going to go with that and that's the history of how they're related. But then came the genomic revolution and we had access to all of these genomes and with all of the genomes then came lots and lots of genes, thousands in fact, and we may be finding that some of the genes tell us one story and some other genes tell us another story. So we just, we just uh, put that to explain why we, we had to tackle with this kind of uh, conflict that existed within the different evolutionary trees that were found. And what happened next, I was not expecting at all. And it is that this, this bit of this one paper of the introduction became a darling of the creationist movement. And the argument was something like this. And it wasn't, it wasn't even, I can't even say that it's misquoted. It's just taking that bit about saying that there's conflict and then extrapolating where it's saying that the fact that there are different evolutionary trees that apply to different genes means that evolution is not is not a good theory to understand the world. And that was just, I, I started asking around different, different colleagues, like what, what is one to do? Should I be, especially colleagues that had actually gone to court here in the United States, this is a matter for the courts regarding, for example, school boards, right? What is going to be called? And, and in the end, I wasn't getting very, a very clear idea about what, what to do next. So I, so I didn't do anything. I just kind of watched as this, little snippet that is regarding like a statistical property uh, of, 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 of genes uh, was getting reproduced in this uh, bizarre context until uh, the National Council for Science Education was uh, participating or, or was actually countering a watering down of the science standards in Louisiana a couple of years ago. And so what was gonna happen was that in middle school, right, uh, this creationist groups were arguing that uh, because, again, because we have these gene trees that don't all match together, then the science standards should be watered down and we should be teaching creationism alongside with, um, uh, with, with the theory of evolution. And so the National Center for Science Education reached out to me and said, look, they're using this quote from your paper. Can you, as the researcher who wrote this, tell us something about it. Is this the correct interpretation? Because that's what it was. It wasn't a quote, it was an interpretation. Is this the correct interpretation? And I, I just felt uh, like it was my opportunity to try to think very clearly and in a very non-technical, non-jargony manner to communicate with those people in the board who are gonna be looking at this and in the court who are gonna look into this. And I said, this is just, a, a, an, it reveals an extraordinary ignorance of both genetics and statistics. And it is a misrepresentation of research that, in fact, does nothing but uh, confirm the basic tenets of descent with modification in genetics in, in the research that we presented. And the most amazing thing is that, is that they won. The National Center for Science Education won. They actually were able to counter this effort to water down the science standards in Louisiana. And uh, since then, I really haven't felt so terrible as I had from my work being Again, I, I can't say that it's misquoted. It just kind of like took verbatim. It's like taking it and then interpreting it in a completely different light that was counter to everything that that paper was about. That's amazing. So, I mean, it worked out in the end, but you were really mostly powerless through that process. I mean, it, someone took something you said, used it in a way that... So do you feel like your standing among scientists was negatively impacted by the fact that it was floating out there on the creationist literature? Do you, do you feel like that hurt your career? I don't, I don't feel like it did, uh, mm -hmm. but I can see ways in which it could have, right? I can yeah, imagine, that's the thing, I, I think. Yeah, I can imagine like being at an earlier career stage, right? Or right. being in a situation, right? I think like, people I, I are, yeah, yeah. 
people are very scared that this that the scientists are all watching the newspaper articles to see where we've misquoted and they're going to judge our science based on how we're quoted in a newspaper article and my experience is that that is not how scientists evaluate each other's work adam you've got your hand up go ahead uh, yeah, a few, a few years ago when I started the wasp survey, we, we were encouraging a few members of the public to put out wasp traps, which basically kill wasps. Um, it's the only way we could get usable data. And we got a huge press backlash from that, um, which again actually worked out well in the end. Um, but it was it was an awful sort of thing. And, and you could see people kind of twisting um, twisting the words and everything. And, and I got a, a phone call from an organization that we were working with, and it was the head of that organization. He had really, really good advice, which I think is worthwhile always bearing in mind. He said, when, when you're next to the fire, it seems very hot and it feels like the entire world. But when you just step away, you realize that the whole world's going on around you and no one else is noticing. And I think huh. that can be one of those things when we're scientists, we're so in front of our stories and we're so concerned with getting things right that we kind of end up thinking that the entire world is actually watching and caring. And in, in reality, sadly, is that very rarely is that the case. And I think that is really good advice, actually. J journalists usually don't mean to, to misquote. They're usually not trying to misrepresent. They're usually trying to get it right. When that happens, it's not necessarily the end of the world that people think it is. And actually, um, you know, that, that advice from, from the CEO of, of the Royal Entomological Society is very, very good. Stand back from the fire and you suddenly realise that life's going mm. on just, just fine because they, you know, it, it, it's, worth, it's worth bearing in mind, I think. And it, it is, is scary though. Chip paper. Tomorrow's chip paper, most of Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case now, of course, with online news, but it's still sort of, it still sort of holds, right? Yes, it is news. Uh, and yeah, I mean, so your point about the, the press don't mean to get it wrong. Yeah, often they don't. And if I get something wrong, I'm mortified, you know, and I, I try and I try too hard to be really accurate with everything to the point where I end up, yeah, just going down rabbit holes trying to fact check and fact check and fact check. And yeah, the reality is you can't, you have to rely sometimes on the person giving you the press release being correct or not go and yeah. double check every single thing in it. And if, the, if it's a scientist who's written a press release about their own research, you're gonna hope it's right. But then you send your story to the editor or the sub-editor who might decide to cut it down and in cutting it down, take out the really critical bit. And then mm, someone sure. else writes the headline and you don't have anything to do with that. And so things get twisted. And I think you're right, your point about your colleagues and your peers aren't going to judge you based on something that you <laughs> quoted in the newspaper. So I think try not to worry about it. I had a story I wrote for um, The Guardian last year about um, the greater horseshoe bats being rediscovered in Kent, which is on the east coast of the UK and it had been missing there for a long time. Um, and that was in The Guardian. And then it was rehashed by, the, by another, another newspaper, let's not name them. Um, and completely twisted into, oh look, climate change isn't real because greater horseshoe bats are recovering in there and the, um, oh no, 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 not climate change isn't real. Climate change, climate change is a bonus because we're all gonna be, we're all gonna do okay. All the animals are gonna do okay because greater horseshoe bats are, are, are recovering now. Look, all because, all thanks to climate change. Hooray, everything's great again. And I'm, right. you know, missing a point. So, and I just thought, oh, whatever, your particular readers are your particular readers and actually, you know, if they want to check the facts, they can look elsewhere. But when it comes to things like that, there's, there's a whole bunch of people that actually probably don't want to know the truth. But at least they would have read about a bat in that particular newspaper, even if some of the information was wrong. Yeah, 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 I think it was Liliana who said there's a benefit to the 24 hour news cycle too. It, the fact that it's, it goes by, and I always use the metaphor of water going under the bridge. It's just like, it just keeps coming and the, the press is on to new things. People get distracted by new stuff. Social media comes up on new things. But there are some topics that generate more stress than others. Tega, you've thought a lot about hunting, for example. So hunting, like there is no way to tread that conversation without pissing somebody off. And you're looking at, you know, bush meat. You're looking at. There's a lot of conversations about wet markets right now in China. So, take a with topics like that. How do you confidently wade in to provide a quote? What are you thinking about in terms of avoiding conflict, or do you just say, "I'm just going for it"? What, how do you handle that? Um, I think this is, yeah, this is a very tricky one because I think I think we're kind of. If I was just going to put some of our outreach or our discussions in a broader framework that you alluded to at the beginning, we kind of began with outreach about our own research, right? Stuff that we're sharing and we feel confident in. And then we can talk about science education and communication about bats more generally. But um, but then sort of this third tier that we're dealing with right now with COVID-19 and other conflict situations or 
directly relevant conservation behaviors such as hunting. So conflict might be conflict over um, fruit crops that fruit bats are taking. This has caused enormous problems in, in Mauritius, which led to a government backed cull that cut, killed off about uh, repeated culls that have potentially wiped out about 30% of the population of an endemic species. Um, so that kind of level of this group of conflict, um, hunting, <clears throat> less of a direct conflict because the animal's not in conflict, it's, it's been hunted. Right? So how do we then move into communication and um, outreach in these much more contentious conflictual situations? And here there may be livelihoods at stake. There are a lot of, there may be um, uh, a huge numbers of misperceptions about the conflict involved that can be very difficult to get to the root of. And then in the, in, with hunting, there can be very different motivations as to why people are hunting. So we have work going on in Southeast Asia um, where people hunt the larger fruit bats, so-called flying foxes. In some places, this is a sport. This is kind of for fun, what you do when you're bored. Other places, it's subsistence. Um, it's a source of subsistence meat in the dry season, right? So you've got these, you can't have a one, um, one answer fits all scenario in some of these uh, situations. So now science communication or these things become much more situational, much more context specific. You as a foreigner may not be the right person to be making any statements. You need to be trying to avoid a situation becoming a conflict and moving up the chain of conflicts um, uh, where you go from sort of something that can be resolved to something where parties become so embedded that it then becomes very difficult to resolve, resolve the situation. Situation. So things become very nuanced once they're embedded in, in these kinds of complex social contexts that, that differ from, from uh, situation to situation. And so in terms of the, the context of these, these messages we're sending out and what we're thinking about and protecting our integrity and, and all these different pieces and how we put our message together, there's a lot that happens that we don't think about consciously. And I think, especially in the last few months, there's been an increased awareness of the diversity crisis in ecology and evolutionary biology. And especially, uh, you know, our, our legacy in the places where we do our work and the fact that we haven't always given as much as we've taken. So uh, I want to think a little bit now about what we communicate when we're, maybe that's not the things we're saying, but it's some of the things that are communicated when we're doing science communication. And uh, maybe I'll start with, with you, Liliana. You, you and I had a, a brief conversation about this. Uh, you were talking about something you called extractivism. Can you sort of articulate that idea? Yeah, so the idea of extract extractivism is a is a term that actually comes from development economics, and it's the idea that actually uh, several countries developing economies, and e even you know, it can even apply to particular provinces or states that are developing, and the route to development is to extract. So usually it's like mining raw materials, right? Like like uh, direct, you know, forest, you know, I can, I can think of like, again, states and provinces in addition to developing countries where the, you know, you're going to provide these raw materials and then the raw materials are bringing in the revenue and then somehow that leads to a path of economic development. And so uh, in economics, it's been heavily criticized, but I want to bring the idea of extractivism into our thinking about this, these field sites because, um, uh, in the sort of context of where I started doing um, a lot of my field work, we did have a bit of an extractivist relationship going on in which we were the scientists. So, uh, and we were, you know, coming from an urban environment, coming from an educated environment, even, even as an undergrad, right? And we're going to these locations that are usually remote, um, taking the samples and the observations and the locality data that we needed and then, uh, and then we kind of made some uh, alchemy with it that makes them into scientific knowledge, right? And what was left behind to the people of, the, of wherever that place was, and, and I'm talking again, I'm not even talking in, in the international context only, I'm talking even, you know, dynamics that are happening with populations that are educated in a university and just going to some remote location. So I'm, so I'm working with several colleagues uh, from throughout the Americas and we're hoping to write this bioethics for the 21st century that are about extractivism. I think Tiga uh, um, in her 
Tina's introduction and in a lot of what she said about this, this bringing together scientists from around the world, this kind of integrating that diversity, integrating that knowledge, building bridges, building paths to education is part of not having that extractivist relationship anymore, right? We just need to, we wanna, we wanna write this and we want to share it with, with other colleagues because I think that not all of us, you know, some of us were actually socialized in a tradition of extractivism. That's definitely the case for me, uh, even, you know, as an undergraduate uh, in Colombia, right? That's, we are the scientists who are going to this remote place, right? And then we're going to take these things and they become scientific. And, you know, if we gave a talk back in the location, maybe we gave a talk, that was it. That was the extent mm -hmm. to which we gave back. And I think that that's not acceptable in today's world anymore. Yeah, I, and I think that uh, the conversation is shifting in terms of who gets credit for doing the science. But I think in terms of the outreach, there's potential there to have some of the local voices helping to explain that stuff. Alex, we talked a little bit about this. And you pointed out the fact that, you know, a lot of diversity, uh, urban areas tend to be diverse and a lot of bats are urban. And so there's maybe a potential there for, for some synergy. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm very aware and people keep pointing it out to me and cover your ears, guys. But um, the white male scientist um, seems to get elevated more than other other groups. Um, and yeah, some people are more confident doing media than others. Um, people from vulnerable backgrounds may not be as confident to go out and talk about their science. And so trying to be supportive of others in your peer group who might just need a bit of encouragement to do it and being aware that um so whether or not you are in a minority group um if you are that minority person you are a role model for everyone in your community who can relate to you who might listen to you because you are that I mean, that black refugee who got into biology who's talking about it's in that language in Bristol, for example, and I can't speak any, any language from that region of the world. So if I do a talk, it's going to be in English. But if somebody like that came along and was interested and I engaged them in doing it with me, I've expanded the people, who, the audience who are interested in the science. Um, if there's somebody who might want to come along and do sign language when you're doing your, your talk, or you can talk to the media and say, look, could we actually get some subtitles in here so that other languages, other people mm -hmm. from different languages who live locally, they might struggle to, to hear what I'm saying if their English isn't very good. But often if you've got the subtitles on there, they can read along and, and it's easier for them to keep up. So. Um, be, being aware of your your duties as a role model and also if you are that that more privileged demographic to perhaps think well are there others in my team I could do it jointly with or can I get some students to do it with me so next time I go on the radio or the TV would one of my students like to talk with me and encourage that diversity that way perhaps. Adam you and I talked about this and you pointed out that sort of one of the rites of passage for EEB is to go out into the field and do work and then come back. And that, that's a little bit of a, a, a silo that isn't available to a lot of people. Yeah, that's right. I mean, most people that want to get into conservation work or into ecology work, particularly field ecology, there is an expectation, you know, degree's not enough. It's not enough that you've got experience within that. You have to have gone and done these kind of overseas experiences. And there's a whole ecosystem of companies now offering highly you know they're very expensive kind of experiences for, for people to go and and bolster their cvs essentially now in some cases they're very good in some cases they're not so good but but parking that to one side quite clearly what that's saying to people is that if you want to get into this field you're going to need to have a considerable amount of financial backing in order to get the experience that, that we need and i think that's something that that, that those of us that are more senior in and sort of involved in in hiring and things really need to take on board um, you know, some, someone that comes to you with a whole list of all these, you know, I did this in Indonesia and I've done that in South Africa and I've done this in Sri Lanka and stuff. Well, you know, that's amazing that you've had the wherewithal to do that, but, but let's not pretend that that's necessarily come from you. Very often that will be supported by your family and your situation. That's, that's not to denigrate that in any way, but it is saying that you are taking a very small subsection of people and you're basically saying to all the others, it doesn't matter how brilliant you are, you know, you don't have this, so we're not even gonna, you're not even gonna pass master, we're not even gonna look at your CV any further. That's something we really need to get out of, I think. And, and the fact that that's true is evidenced by just the number of companies now which are offering these kind of thinly mm -hmm. disguised CV enhancing experiences. And I think we, 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 need, to, we need to realize that. 
So Adam, how do you, in your research group, how do you help to improve the diversity of voices that are doing the science communication? Um, well, what I try to do, if um, what I tend to do with my research group is not particularly large in that sense, and, and, and what I get asked to do is quite diverse. So um, what I usually try to do if something's coming in that I don't really need to speak about, you know, if I don't, don't particularly want to be there, I try to make suggestions for other people. Generally speaking, you know, people say, oh, are they any good? Well, I don't know, you know, because they haven't talked. Why don't you? They seem good on the phone. You know, and just try and try and get um, journalists and people to to see other people and to speak to them and to and to realize that there are other people out there now obviously you know all of us like to like to talk about our science too so I'm not going to pretend that I don't I don't you know talk about flying ants when the opportunity comes up but if the opportunity is is, is more tangential to what my interests are then then I increasingly find myself sort of saying that you know I can put you in touch with people, I can give you some context and background, but why don't you quote these people, you know, why don't you go and speak to them and get their perspective? And I think that's something that, again, you know, those of us that are a bit more senior and, and have, have done some of these things and have already got the recognition for doing it, you know, maybe we can pass the baton on a little bit and make some active suggestions because if a journalist is speaking to you and you give them a good link, the immediate thing they're going to do is contact that link. And if they say yes, then they're on the hook, right? No one's going to spend days and days doing doing searching they don't need to. So I think that's something that we can all think about as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I also like the idea that not everything has to be about science. And so we could be reaching into the communities where we work and talking to people who aren't scientists and finding ways to bridge it to art, music, culture, uh, food, uh, tourism, all these different pieces that don't necessarily have to be scientific. Tig, I just wanna, while we're on this topic, I just wanna get just your thoughts on this because you know, you've, you've been very successful in getting the voices of, that come from those places where you do the work, getting those voices to be speaking about the science. How, how do you cultivate those relationships? Um, I think s slowly and uh, I, I, through real mutual relationships, I guess would be the way that these aren't things you sort of fly into a workshop and fly out. These are things where you build relationships over many years, you build your networks, you play the long game, I think is probably the best best way I would express this. Um, you work with in country, up and coming scientists in a dream world, I like them to come and join my lab in the US before they go, go back. Then I have professional connections, but others we've built the network in Southeast Asia, the CV crew, um, and so, then there's mutual support connecting people what happens a lot in biodiversity research in some parts of the world is people can feel very isolated so just as we we think there aren't many ecologists in north america well there's even fewer in, in some of these frontline countries with the highest biodiversity and the greatest number of threats and there may be even fewer people doing bat research so this is one of the key problems we're facing in in studying that's let alone communicating and sharing their plight with the rest of the world is that in fact, I had a conversation with one of my grad students yesterday Aurora what do we do in West Africa there are many countries in West Africa that don't have biodiverse have a bat researcher there are people when we began in Southeast Asia some hot spots of diversity research bat diversity research some countries with nobody how do we work as a community to strengthen our existing, join the nodes, connect people who are working on bats so they don't feel so isolated, enable them to reinforce one another, reinforce their message, come up with a united message. What happens in one country often happens in a neighboring country when it comes to conservation issues. How can people share their expertise? How can you then move forward and say, okay, there is nobody in this country country how can we work to get somebody in there and promote their career and support one another to to build these these relationships up and to ensure coverage of uh, bat research on a, on a regional or global scale so but that stuff doesn't happen overnight right and so we've really got to i my view is we play the long game build relationships um support one another um and that's really the future if we want protection of bats and sustainable bat populations um, at the global scale. Right, because communication is a way to take action, as, as Liliana said, that was such a great, great thing she said early on. Um, so we've, we've been chatting for about, for over an hour now, and so I want to uh, be mindful of people's time and uh, start to wrap up, but I, I just thought it would be a good idea to give each of my panelists the opportunity to just give a, a final thought, just, you know, a, sort of a one minute uh, 
just an idea they want to leave this audience with. And so, uh, Tiga, since you're already giant on my screen, maybe I'll, I'll start with you. What final thought do you want to leave this audience with? Um, oh, gosh. Ah, um, um, I've got so many thoughts. Uh, I, in the context of communicating, I think it is communicating across levels. It's communicating with, with your peers, with your colleagues, taking that first step, writing your press release, share that with others in the research community. Um, and so I think the message really of this, of this whole um, webinar is to communicate but but think broadly communicate across scales okay that's great thank you Liliana any final thoughts from you yeah in terms of science communication I think um, I think having um, I, I think some of the Q&A also were saying you know there's people make mistakes and journalists make mistakes and most of them uh, as Adam said you know most journalists are actually trying to do a good job this is just a good faith effort they may not have the um, they may not have the background for that, uh, for the specifics of that. So just don't be afraid to communicate, distill your message, find a way to distill your message. There is actually uh, online, there's a lot of resources that can help you do that because it's an acquired skill. It's something that you're going to have to hone over a long time in order to communicate the best that you can and go for it because it is a 24 hour cycle. And if you're thinking something terrible happened as a result of what got reported from your research, it will be over soon. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Alex? Well, um, I've just posted a message on the message board, I think. Yeah, so I'm doing something sort of related to this, gathering evidence of good and bad science communication in, in the news and how science and, uh, and journalists can help, help each other and how we can improve things. So I've just put my Twitter feed um, tag on there. But one other quick thought is science can be fun. Science should be fun. And if you're a lay, for a lay audience, use different styles so think how can i get my science into culture so can i use art can i use music can i use craft can i get storytelling going in different ways so that my science becomes embedded in the local culture in whatever community or country i'm working in and that can sometimes be another way into science for people that might not necessarily want a dry news story on science that's a great idea and adam um i would say say yes um, be, be the person that says yes when they phone you or when they email you and 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 yes it might be quite scary but let's be honest most of the time most of us are winging it for most of what we do and if you just jump in and get stuck into it you you will find that groove and that confidence and one time will become two times and then suddenly they'll contact you again and the thing snowballs and, and you you will build that confidence up quickly but I think that the key point is just to jump in immediately and say yes for that first time and and don't be afraid because ultimately you do know what you're talking about and that's why they want to speak to you. That's great advice. And, and it echoes something I've, I've said quite often that a, a lot of people are blind to the fact that they'd get better at this with practice, just like we get better at doing science. The more of this outreach you do, the better you get, the easier it gets. You know, I, I do this for a living now uh, and I look at some of the stuff I did during my PhD and I cringe, but I got better. And you know what, it's a learning curve and, and you know, the news cycle has long forgotten that stuff. So I just have a couple of final thoughts I want to read here. Um, I mentioned when I started that Liliana is the co-author on this remarkable uh, paper that came out last week in Nature describing the genomes of six bats. And one of my favorite quotes in that paper, I'm going to hold it up here. I don't know if you can see me. Are we still looking at Adam? Can you get me on camera? Is that possible? Are we still? Is, can we? Yeah, yeah, there I am. Still... Hey, OK, good. So I highlighted it here. This is like my favorite part of the paper. And sorry, Liliana is going to be mad because her far better parts of the paper if this is your field. But I like that it says, the completeness of our gene annotations is higher than available annotations of dog, cat, horse, cow, and pig, and is only surpassed by those of human and mouse. And so the point here is that when bat biologists contribute to a field, they kick ass. They do a really good job. They do it better than anyone's done it before them. And that's true in this field, but it's also true in animal behavior. It's true in biomechanics. Uh, it's true in sensory ecology and a whole bunch of other fields. There's just something about bats that makes bat people do it well. And I think when it comes to communicating science, we bat biologists have the opportunity to lead there as well. We, we, we're set up to be the best in the world at this. Uh, people want to know about bats already, especially with COVID-19 going on. And we know the inner lives of bats so well that we can engage our audiences on that emotional level. Um, it's, it's, uh, the bats are doing the heavy lifting for us. We just have to put the ball in the net. Like it's, it's much easier for us than it is. God help the people that have to do this with wasps. Adam, I'm sorry, it's gotta be very hard for you, but we have it easy. 
Um, uh, so in the last hour, we've learned a lot. Uh, we've talked about communication and communication is a two way thing, right? Anybody who taken their basic animal behavior knows this. And so listen to your audience, build relationships, right? That's something that's come up multiple times in different contexts here. If you wanna have a good relationship with the press, work on that relationship. If you wanna build relationships with the people where you're working, the people in your community, you've gotta build those relationships. You can't stay in a silo. That's just not acceptable anymore for scientists. Um, we've talked about the fact that journalists have different objectives from ours, but they were not necessarily in conflict. So even if they get their big spider billboard, we can still get our good spider science into the article itself. Have a clear message, that helps you, that helps them. Um, and we can be helpful to the journalists. We're not parasites of them, we're, uh, we're mutualists. Um, tailor your message to a broad audience, uh, including people that might not see the world the way you do. Not everybody loves bats right out of the gate, so don't take that assumption. Think about what your message is for people that aren't, that aren't on the same page as you to start. They'll get there, they're just not there yet. Um, we can help bats by setting social norms around bats. So Tigga's a uh, great comment, and I hope it wasn't missed, that she makes a point of having people in her lab get pictures of not only the bats they work on, but of themselves with the bats smiling to sort of set the conversation of what it means to work with bats and what that relationship is like, what that experience is like, so that you're not just talking about the science of the bats, you're talking about the human experience of being a bat biologist, which is very powerful. And frankly, is a big part of why a lot of us are bat biologists in the first place is because of the fun of doing it. Um, uh, it's important to make the work accessible to as many people as possible. So you want to involve women and people of color in as much of your work as possible. You've got to build those communities. And as Tigga said, build, play the long game on those. You're, you're, this isn't just something you go and give a talk, you pat yourself on the back, you give yourself a check mark, and then you get, get out of there and drive back home to your university. This is, it's a long-term uh, investment you're making uh, in your science, but also in your science communication. And uh, I, you know, we, we finished with this. Adam's last point was just get out there. You're not going to ruin your career. It's okay. And I can tell you, I have had, I have made full on errors on live TV plenty of times and it's fine. It's, you, you get some angry tweets, you acknowledge your mistake, you move on. It's fine. Um, so I, I guess the last thing I'll do uh, before we go here is uh, thank our panelists, of course, Liliana Davalos, Adam Hart, Alex Morse, Tigga Kingston for your time, your expertise, your careful uh, communication to us on this. I think it's just been uh, marvelous. Uh, I want to thank GBATnet, the IUCN Bat Specialist mm -hmm. Group, the University of Oxford, National University of Singapore, Technical University of Berlin, and Texas Tech University for their assistance. Uh, special thanks to some people working behind the scenes, scenes uh, Tanya Straka, uh, Susan Tsang, Joanna Coleman, uh, and Ewan McDonald. They've been working very hard to make this go as smoothly as it has. And uh, of course, I have to thank you, the viewer, the participant for your questions, for, for listening, and for hopefully taking what we've learned here and bringing it into your practice so that you can become more effective as a science communicator and feel like you're better equipped to do that. So thank you so much. I'm Dan Riskin. Thanks for watching. Happy batting. <laughs>